Okay, good afternoon, everybody. There we go. My ma now my face is over there. Good. Um, good afternoon. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to talk today. A um, bit of a privilege for me. Uh, 20 years ago, I was uh, graduating from Fashion Textiles in Brighton and had my first job in ladies wear and asked a very stupid question. Who's going to be the customer? And I got fired. Yes. So 20 years later, I'm still telling those fashion brands who their customer is going to be. And uh, we have a very privileged position to work with innovators and early adopters, people like Tom around the world, who are at the forefront of change. Um, and your industry is at the forefront of change, but the pace at which you change is getting too fast. So we want to slow things down a little bit. Who here thinks they're going to live to their 100? Hands up. A couple of you. Keep your hands up if you're from Switzerland. No, I'm joking, I'm joking. Um, because we have to start asking some questions about long-termism. Um, I've been shot down quite a few times at conferences for saying things like, it's not about save the planet, it's about save the human. Um, about the fact that we are now having children. I've got three children under five, and they will probably live to their 100, which is going to be a nice, lifelong dad job. Great, another bit of money for you another bit of money for you. And who here is in their 50s and par their parents are starting to say, can I move back in now? <laughs> so the point of the immortal brand is not about immortality. Um, it's about understanding what does long-termism actually mean? Um, there's some chief fashion sort of people out there right now who are thinking of retiring from their jobs without those sort of monocles, what will be, what will be their title? There are, of late, the likes of Yves Saint Laurent, whose brand is now called Saint Laurent. Um, they've dropped the Eve. What does it mean when you are no longer here? When you are Ricardo Tisci looking after a brand, or when you are Alexander Wang looking after a bang, brand? When those designers passed away decades ago. And the idea being of this sort of immortality is an interesting concept, because for the last couple of months or so, we've been consulting with our clients about the subject of sustainability. And it's not about save the planet and hug pandas and trees. It's about being in business in 150 years' time. And who doesn't want to be in business in 150 years' time? None of you will be here. You might be here if you're from Switzerland. But the point being that some of us are thinking, well, that's quite hard to get my head around. And this is the subject we wanted to look at today, which is the rise of sustainability, but in a different context. Now, if I click, is this going to work? We've got a little game now. It's got to get all that way, about 100 meters to the back of the room. Can you click for me? Is that OK? I love technology. The year little is video. 2015. In a decade that has given us the global financial crisis, the Arab Spring and ISIS, we discover that the second half of the turbulent teens will be no less tumultuous and problematic than the first. Military standoffs continue in Ukraine. Rockets fall on Tel Aviv and Gaza. Armies revolt in Egypt and Thailand. And the far right marches in Europe once more. In this era of globalization, the Earth feels smaller. In this age of superconnectivity, time seems shorter. And in a world of continuous, rapid innovation, permanence itself seems elusive and transient. But the pushback has already begun. Awkward questions are now being asked. Complex solutions are now being embraced. Cross-generational timeframes to achieve our goals are now being considered and implemented. This is the age of the long near. An era in which generations rather than individuals are tasked with changing our world. Time rather than gas, coal, oil or wind is the commodity we need to help us survive and thrive amid these new and future challenges to develop and define whole system thinking. Science, nature and biotechnology are being drawn on to help us achieve 100 year lifespans. Cathedral thinking and long-now strategies are the methods being employed to develop 1,000-year corporations. But the age of the long near requires us to act, to think, to do, to define, but above all, to commit. For the now, 
for the next, for the long near. Okay, so that was a little short film we made back in March. Uh, twice a year, ooh, nearly fell off the stage then. Twice a year we do a big event in line with the fashion season. So every March and September we do our trend briefing. And that was from our March trend briefing, our spring summer trend briefing. And it was very much about understanding that increasingly we have to think about the long near. But that's difficult. If you have a conversation with your CFO, if we go to the next slide please. If you have a conversation with your CEO, and your CFO about a 150-year business plan, you'll be fired. And yet, that's the kind of sustainability we have to start asking ourselves. So if we go to the next slide, thank you. Um, here's a quote um, from Phil Libin. Uh, some of you might know Evernote, that whiz-bang app that allows you to write and speak, and it creates Word documents. Time is not money. Time is so much more precious than money. You can always get more money, but you can never get more time. And you might have heard that in the video, that time is now the new commodity. Is time running out, or do we have lots of time? And it's this interesting game, because again, you're in the business of time. You're in the business of seasonality. You're in the business of design. You're in the business of, again, a la mode. So what does it mean to keep that perpetual motion going of taste and style, and taste and style every single second? And we heard from Tom that not just music and not just film, but fashion is now about that fast-paced consumption model. You know, my daughter's five and my son is three, and they're already bored of the world. They're already going, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Now, that kind of speed of change, we can't keep up with as designers. The community that is our industry has to think about slowing down for all sorts of reasons. Seven years on from the start of the financial crisis in a world ravaged by climate change and buffeted by political instability, it is impossible to think uh, about this idea of short-term thinking. Who here, how many women in the audience? This is going to be easy because we're in the fashion industry. How many men, actually? Hands up. How many men? About 10. Okay. <laughs> I've presented this at the World Banking Conference the other way around, okay? One woman going, me! So what we have to start thinking about is that men, unfortunately, well, we work in fashion, so it's okay, but most men only use the left-hand side of their brain, naturally. Women naturally use the whole of your brain, as in collective. So the idea being that, and most men in fashion, they do spark off on this side, and that's stage right, by the way. And the idea being that increasingly, to handle this stuff, we have to start using the whole of our brain. Now, there's a great woman called Linda Stone, who's the ex-vice president of Microsoft, and she said if it was called Lehman Sisters, we wouldn't be in this situation. <laughs> I think that's a fantastic point, isn't it? Imagine in that stock room, 2007, women going, should we? I don't know, let's talk about it. <laughs> Men going, well, I'm weak if I don't. Okay, I'll do it. Because men think in lines, women think laterally. So again, we have to start looking at new skill sets. Now, you are an industry that's built on that skill set to imagine, to craft, to create. How do you teach the other industries about the kind of skill sets needed to think long term? We go to the next slide, thank you. Um, because what we start to see is that this kind of endemic short-sightedness is affecting lots of things. It's affecting us as people. I've been using the word human a lot in the last year, not the word consumer. Who here feels like they're a human again? The fact that they're thinking, what am I eating? What am I drinking? Who are my children? Who is my partner? Who are my work colleagues? Maybe I should stop for a second and actually just think about being a human. Those of you who run companies that don't think employees are humans, they're humans as much as the people buying your clothing. So it's this whole idea that the cycle of humanity is changing. I had a brief the other day from Imar, who built Dubai. They're the architectural business behind Dubai. And they want us to do the retail district strategy for Dubai, which is the size of London. Like, fucking ridiculous brief. Like, the size of London. They said, but we want to put humanity at the heart of it. And I said, that's because it's a guilt trip, because Dubai has no humanity. If anyone had been to Dubai and you try and have that sense of, what is Dubai? And it's manufactured. So increasingly, we're seeing all sorts of industries say, how do we start to think about this sense of, of long-termism and humanity, as opposed to short-term profits? Uh, next slide, please. 
And I think it's this idea being that increasingly we have things like cathedral challenges. We'll talk about cathedral thinking later. Uh, the idea of a long near strategy and how to even start one step forward on a 150 year business plan. And the idea of ubalescence, I don't mean taxis, I mean the idea being the fact that something will last. Your clothing will last more than one season. <gasps> and some of you are thinking, my CFO is not going to like that because we have to sell more bags again. And yet we see increasingly the likes of Everlane in Los Angeles, now being run by Rebecca Bay, who set up COS, who, who basically run away from Gap, is now saying, thank God there's a brand out there that could be the next J Crew, that could be the next Gap that is thinking long term, about 15 year business plans, and not trying to make trade every Friday. So different ways of thinking. Let's move to the next slide. So the idea being that there's a little video, actually. You might like this. Success. I wasn't prepared to translate that. That's that right. little mark with the A and then the ring around it. At? See, that's what I said. Um, Katie said she thought it was about. Yeah. There it is. <laughs> At AM feedback. When what is internet that, anyway? What do you write to it like mail? Here's Allison. Can you explain what internet is? See, that's what I said. What do you mean there's nothing under the hood? Katie said she thought this was a car. Yeah. And it's built using wind? Like from a windmill? Or a fan? Or a turbine? Or a fan vine? Wow. I mean, what is I3 anyway? Allison, can you explain what I3 is? <laughs> so some things do change and some things don't change. And I think the point being that we're all old, OK? We're all over 25. So we have to understand the fact that we're growing up in a world, we're maturing in a world that we're not born into. And we all think it's quite cool that we have a new iPad for Christmas or a pair of virtual reality glasses from Samsung. And we're like, wow, it's so cool. I can watch X Factor like this now. So increasingly, we have to start preparing for a world that is fundamentally different. And I'm not ageist. I'm the one who's only investing in the over 50s because millennials have no money. But the idea being that what does it mean to actually move forward in a world that is moving so fast? Uh, next slide, thank, thank you. And I think it's this idea being Next slide, thank you. Come on, clicker. <laughs> thank you. So what is driving all of this? Next slide. OK, so we've mentioned short-termism. Interestingly, in America, nearly a third of working-age Americans have no retirement plan and no retirement savings. Who here has a retirement plan? Who here is, who's here is going to retire? Like, what does retirement mean now? My mum and dad are 65, and they're really bored. They're like, oh, God, I've got like 30 years left on this planet to just buy stuff and go on holiday and cruises and cruise. So increasingly, what does it mean to live a 100-year lifespan? And you're in the business of essentially clothing, right? So what does it mean to say, hello, 12-year-old? Oh, no, let's start from the beginning. Hello, one-day-year-old. You can't be naked all your life all the way through to their 100. That's a lovely business plan, isn't it? 99, say 97 years of CRM, relationship management, and saying, and there's more clothing, and there's more clothing. So what does it mean to have that sense of sustaining the interests of your customers? America's top killer isn't cancer or heart disease or smoking or obesity. It's their inability to overcome their own short-term behavior. Now, that's very different to other parts of the world. And my wife is Norwegian, and they're very, very long-term. I go, well, we need, to, we need to do something quickly. She's like, well, we've got years. It's fine. I've got sovereign wealth behind me. My country's the richest in the world, but doesn't spend any of it. So increasingly, again, think about the cultural differences that make Belgium and Antwerp different, that give you a unique selling point. The mindset that is, again, that sort of slightly northern European mindset. What does it mean to have that versus other parts of the world? If we move to the next slide. And we start to think about the idea being that you are running businesses, or some of you work for businesses. Um, interestingly, 24% of FTSE 100 companies changed CFO uh, in, in the years 2013-2014, up from 13%. The average CEO lasts seven years, which is actually quite long. But actually, but, so if, you're, if you've got a CEO that's telling you, I want a five-year business plan because my CFO is wanting to see the numbers, they'll be gone before that five-year business plan actually starts. 
So we start to think about, again, what is the commitment? I have so many briefs that go across my desk, which is we want to do a five-year strategy. I'm thinking, but you won't be here at the end of it. So what does it mean, again, to run a business? Does that mean we become more by month, kind of month-by-month month strategies? Or do we just be realistic about the fact that let's build something that none of us are going to be here to enjoy, but that's okay, and we'll talk about that later. These are short lifespans and not long enough to implement strong strategic change. Interestingly, Germany was the first market to come out of the financial crisis because it didn't change anything. It just said, well, we've had a strategy for a very long time and we're just doing the strategy. In the UK, for example, and France, they waited to see what America did. They waited a year to see what America did and go, well, we'll just have a chat. We'll have a talk about it. The idea being having a strong backbone and saying, we are now five years into what we call the turbulent teens. Who here has teenagers? Hands up. Who here is feeling a bit tired today? Because that's what the economy and that's what the environment are like. They're like teenagers. Ups and downs and mood swings and good bits and bad bits and hangovers and bonuses and, oh, for God's sake, you haven't got enough likes. So increasingly, that is what it's like at the moment in the economy and in the environment. And handling that is like being a parent. You have to understand how to deal with a teenager. And that's what it's like running a company. Next slide. So given all of this, you know, the average consumer spends 13 seconds buying a brand in store and 19 seconds online. And most people wouldn't care if 73% of brands disappeared tomorrow. So we'll just go home and eat bread. Or just go and set up a bakery or something. Or maybe go and do some gardening, because there's no point, is there? We think this matters, and yet humans out there go, mm, not really. You know, I, st I stood up at the, the, the Retail Federation conference in America last year and said, what right does Apple think to have, what right does Apple think it has to be alive in five years' time? What about Coca-Cola? What about Pepsi? What about IBM? What about Burger King? What about McDonald's? All these brands that we think, oh, they'd be around forever. Will they? I don't know. So again, thinking long term. I sat in a boardroom, a blockbuster, that retailer in the UK that sells videos. Remember videos? And they said, I was in a room and the CEO said, this digital blip will go away. Wow. And one year later, the company went bankrupt. So increasingly, what does it mean to think beyond fashion, to think beyond humanity, and think way, way into the future. I get stuck at about 2030, I just start making it up after that. Because at that point it's about, you've just got to imagine this kind of stuff. You've got to imagine what could be. And one of the greatest failings of the American government was not imagining what would happen in, when 9-11 when happened. And imagining that kind of stuff, good things, bad things, that kind of imagination skill is what the right brain is for, and we are in a room full of right brains. Okay, next slide. Lots of fairy tale innovation. Now, the idea of making just more stuff. Uh, interestingly, there's 100,000 health and fitness apps, and yet we see rising obesity around the world. We want flying cars and said we got 140 characters, said the founder of PayPal. And yeah, Google Glasses, oh, it's going to change our world. Oh, no, we're not going to do it. Who, who feels like let down at that moment? Of like, oh, OK, I was quite looking forward to going to a DVF fashion show. Because increasingly, this kind of innovation, the promises of this stuff, is what we hang our Christmas bonuses on. It's what we think, well, that's going to make our catwalk more interesting, or it's going to make our magazine more interesting, or it's going to make our advert more interesting. It's going to make my store more interesting. Or is it? I always think technology is a bit like a trendy dad at a disco. You know, when you leave that massive iPad at the back of the store for just a bit too long. And increasingly, we have to start thinking beyond these sorts of innovation points and start thinking differently. Uh, next slide, please. Because the idea being that this sort of cathedral challenge, and one of the things about cathedral thinking is, if you think about cathedrals, in the very, very early days of, of, of humanity, where an, an architect and a government maybe said, we want to build a cathedral, it's going to take 150 years to make. Um, none of us will be here, we will have died by the time it's made. I need a couple of million pounds, or euros, well, euros didn't exist then, so let's go back to, say, kroner. Um, and 
uh, yes, can I have the money? Oh, the drawing looks lovely. Yes, great, lovely. And well, um, see you later. Bye. Now, how many times now do you see that kind of pitch? I want to build a cathedral that none of us are going to be alive to see. It's very, very hard with our short-term mindsets to get that kind of decision-making going. And yet, what are the things that still stand tallest within villages and towns, cathedrals? What are the things that still congregate humanity in times of crisis, churches and cathedrals? So it's an interesting kind of analogy to say, what are your cathedral strategies? If you were to have one cathedral strategy that's your legacy, to say, I'm going to do something, I'm just going to leave it on my boss's desk, and hopefully it will get executed. And it's that kind of bravery, that kind of imagination that changes the game. Uh, Louis Vuitton, one of those brands that's put its foot forward and said, we're going to create a fondation that none of you will be around to see the results. There's no return on investment for you in the room, but it is for future generations and generations and generations and generations. Chanel, running around the world, buying up all the kind of rose, uh, uh, rose uh, beds and making sure that they have enough rose being uh, uh, grown to allow their fragrance business to continue. I was in uh, Helsinki last week with Fiskars Corporation. Those of you in fashion know who Fiskars are, Scissors brand. They have 18 hectares of woodland and forest, the biggest in Europe, just in case. And it's this kind of investment strategy. There is no, there's no short-term gain on it. It's long-term investments. Uh, next uh, slide, please. So what is the impact of all of these drivers? These are just drivers. These are things that are just happening at 35,000 feet and making us go, life's a bit weird right now. Who here has been questioning the point of existence? And what is Christmas? And what is Sunday all about? And am I eating the right kind of food? Who am I? What's my DNA telling me? All these sorts of questions about existence. Well, the impact of all of this means that we're now thinking in a different way. Uh, next slide, please. Um, if we go to the next slide, keep going. And the idea being that what is your behavior as a business? Uh, next slide, thanks. Uh, what is, oh, it's got to build, sorry. That confused you, didn't it? <laughs> um, I'll just talk slowly while the build happens. Um, what does it mean to create platforms, to create communities, to create networks, to create systems, and not just bags? Because increasingly, we have to start thinking about our, our sort of social legacy. That's a new term I've seen from the kind of millionaires of the world who are out there thinking about their social legacy. And it's about saying, what's the impact you want to leave on this planet or leave on humans? Um, behavior brands, this is uh, the CEO of CVS. Don't know if any of you know CVS in America. CVS is a bit like, it's a pharmacy in America. His wife uh, died from uh, smoking-related cancer, uh, lung disease, and he took it so, obviously, so personally and so seriously that he said, why the hell are we selling cigarettes in our health stores? We sell drugs to help people, we sell cigarettes to make people need drugs. Now, that's actually a really good supply chain, by the way. But the point being, he said, enough. So, he stopped selling tobacco and launched, stopped the, the whole campaign, One Good Reason. And he quote here, uh, retailers are myopically obsessed with what they sold today. That's the DNA of the industry. So thinking about small changes that can lead to quite a big ground shift. And what's interesting about this sort of prohibition culture that is rising is that more of us are starting to see certain industries like sugar, tobacco, etc., as the kind of arch enemies of, of our humanity. And not to get into the whole slight Al Gore speech, but what does it mean to really talk about or go near some of those subjects which are tricky? And what does it mean to affect his profit and loss? He was making good money out of selling cigarettes, but he took a decision. He took a stand and he, he created behavior as a brand. So what are your behaviors that you want to start doing to make this kind of change? Uh, next slide, please. And we start to think about the idea of vertical commerce and what does it mean to own the whole supply chain. Uh, this is the Essential Collection by Zadie, a new fashion startup. And they're basically buying up factories, they're buying up farms, they're buying sheep, they're doing everything they can to control the supply chain, which as you've seen outside there. And okay, it's a, it's a micro scale, but we now see people going to China and saying, I will buy the factory just to make sure Bangladesh doesn't happen again. Because the idea being that I want to make sure I can not just control it because I can watch the P&L and the craftsmen and make sure they're putting the bead on properly, but actually because my young consumer 
wants to trace everything right back to who actually made it. Was it really a sheep? Was it, are you sure it wasn't a horse? You know, increasingly, I really want to know where something came from. There, this, this, there is this moment happening. The conscious consumer is thinking not just about how pretty a product is or how cool it is, but how it is made and how it's going to live in your closet. The majority of carbon footprint is not from, uh, not from the manufacturing, it's from you using product, us using products, putting it in the washing machine, not using, hot, uh, or not using cold water instead of hot water. So all of these sorts of logistics now means that you've got our Gen Z, our, our teenagers, growing up now going, well, why don't you do that? I don't get it. You know, if you think about the generational differences, Gen X, you know, the kind of 35 to 45 year olds, no logo, went and protested, cut themselves a Mohican and went, ah, Nike. And then you've got Gen Y who go, well, I'll cause change by setting up my own company called Uber or Airbnb and I'll transform the industry. And now you've got Gen Z going, I'm just not going to consume. And that's the biggest threat of all. The biggest threat to Google is that you don't use their search engine. And all of a sudden, the engine winds down and they stop making funky glasses. So all of a sudden, you've got a Gen Z coming up there going, if I don't spend, that's the biggest threat. Next slide. Wear brown shoes after six. Wear a hat indoors. Wear a short skirt after 40. Wear a short skirt if you're a man. Try too hard. Don't try it all. Dress like a girl. Dress like a man. Dress like a teen. Stand out. Blend in. Mix prints. Mix pink and red. Be old. Be new. There are no rules in fashion, but one. Recycle your clothes. Okay, so quick sense check now. This is, this is an exam, a test. Who believes that? Hands up. Oh, one person. What, two? Okay, who doesn't believe that? Wow. Okay. H&M, are you in the room? <laughs> because this is true, actually. But isn't it interesting how even us older consumers are now growing up in a world where we're thinking, nah, it can't be real. It can't be true. And it's this interesting kind of change now that our, our sort of our intelligent minds, our savvy Google minds are now starting to ask all the questions that big brands don't want us to ask. So if you're a small brand, what does that mean for you? How do you deal with a landscape now that's incredibly difficult? And I don't mean competitive because there's a French brand or a South American brand or a Japanese brand that's going to beat you, because the competition is your consumer now. And they could easily just 3D print your shoes at home. So that's, that's a whole different conversation, different presentation. But actually, the, the competition is their mind. So let's keep moving on. So as we start, next slide, as we start to move to the kind of the, the future, what does it mean to think about ways of thinking differently? Um, use the best, the best as a benchmark, compare yourself to leaders outside your sector, uh, assume nothing, challenge, challenge a key assumption every year. You know, who is the kind of chief, chief uh, uh, annoying officer in the business who goes, why, 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 why? That's why they call Generation Y, by the way. Um, 25 to 34 year olds, why? Why? Because increasingly we have to ask ourselves five whys. If any of you do innovation workshop soon, ask the person who's come up with an idea five times why. Why? 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 And why? And then you finally get to the root of why that idea is actually being done, which is something fundamentally different to because it's shiny. And that's the kind of fundamental analysis and interrogation that we have to start going through as businesses. And you're not alone. OK, next slide. So the consequences of all of this, uh, next slide, please. Uh, are th there's lots of things that affect us. And I think what's interesting here is about letting go. I think you're not alone. We need to understand that as a community, the whole point of this fashion talks is to bring you together as a world-class community to say you are actually a club for thought leadership. So the idea being that bringing that sort of debate together becomes very interesting. 
Uh, next slide, please. Um, oh, we've got a nice build. So altruvation. Interestingly, altruvation is a kind of theory whereby if you've invented something, giving, giving it, give it, give it away. Uh, Caring, for example, has agreed to share its new sustainability uh, methodologies with the industry as a whole. Uh, Caring is working with H&M um, and sustainability startup Born Again on a new recycling technology. And Toyota uh, have almost 6,000 patents available free of charge. They're not scared. They're saying, look, we're so confident as a brand that we can give away this ingenuity because if this ingenuity isn't given away, the whole industry won't move forward. And if you're a 15-year-old growing up in a world and you see Toyota or Caring or Gucci or Stella McCartney doing this, you go, that's really cool. That's really, really nice. I like that. That's a good idea. As opposed to, I don't know who they are because they're at the top of a big tower in Manhattan. I don't know who's up there. It's that ivory tower. I can't access it. So the democratization of brands is not about user-generated content and Instagram. It's about this. It's about saying, we've come up with something great. Go, people. And that kind of relationship now is very, very different. Because you're dealing with young minds saying, I'm going to stick with you for 70 years. And yes, you're going to get my, my euros, but you're going to get my loyalty in all sorts of other ways. Uh, next slide, please. And that idea of sort of like uh, doing something to, to, to outlive its, its uh, shelf life is, is a tricky one for you, especially your industry. Designing a product that lasts for generations at peak performance and which requires no maintenance service or replacement must be the long-term goal. Um, the 30-year sweatshirt comes from a 30-year guarantee to ensure uh, longevity. Uh, Google's Project Ara employs altruvation to create a modular smartphone, as we'll see. Next slide. up. Who wants the iPhone 7? No, 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 no. And that not that amazing? Because iPhones make you go, I never had an iPhone 5 before. No, what is iPhone 5? Oh, it doesn't matter. And this kind of attitude of like, it doesn't matter, just stick with the same device for the whole of your life and just keep changing it. Imagine if you said, don't worry about your sleeves, we'll put new sleeves on for you. Or put your own sleeves on it, it's fine. And that doesn't mean going to a craft school in Spitalfields in London or Berlin. It means actually giving them the ability to upgrade themselves, like a technology system. How different is that mindset? OK, next slide. Running out of time. So the idea of being of waiting for something. Now, that's very tricky for you. But imagine if you got this jewelry at Christmas, but you had to give it to them in September. It's nearly a birthday. Not quite, though. So you have to get the timing just right. Now it's about a week before your birthday. The day before your birthday. Happy birthday. Now imagine if fashion catwalks worked on that cycle. You can't see it. You can't have it yet. Just have to wait, sorry. Just six days before Anna gets her hand on it. And the idea being that that real sense again of moving at a different pace, it's the art of waiting. The art of being bored, actually teaching people to be bored. What do you do while you're waiting? Um, uh, Instagram. And it's, again, a whole etiquette and a whole way of thinking that's coming through now. Let's keep going. Next slide. So uh, moving forward, the futures. Uh, where does this all take us then? So you could probably tell there's some different business models here, some different mindsets, some different behaviors, some different kind of KPIs, key performance indicators that we have to start embedding in our business. Uh, if we go to the next slide, please, um, and the next one. Has that got a nice build on it? Keep going. There we go. So 
Descendant marketing is an interesting concept that we've seen come through within product design. Um, time capsule products will be targeted at future generations. So these are products that slowly release and reveal what they're actually about. So the usability of them gets better and better and better over decades, not years. So the future library and artwork compiled over 100 years will be released in 2114. I can't wait to see that. Can't wait for the opening. i walk in like this going, hello. Um, then artist Jonathan Keats made 100 pinhole cameras uh, with an exposure length of 100 years. Uh, the first people to see this picture will be children who haven't been conceived. Again, try and take that back on Monday morning and think about that when you're thinking of your collection for spring, summer 2017. Whoa, that's really going to blow your chief creative officer's mind. And Cognac brand Louis VIII has commissioned a film starring John Malkovich that won't be released for 100 years. Next slide, please. In 2015, I, John Malkovich, shot a film which will be held for 100 years. The time required to create Louis XIII. Imagine the future. You're late. You miss me that much? Must be terrible for you. Okay, thank you very much, thank you. I can hear from the audience that they were as enthusiastic as me about this. But I have a provocative question for yes. you. Since all of this, what you said, I believe it's true and I hope it's true. So why is it that the likes of Primark are expanding into the world and getting a lot of press about that? Yeah. And Zara is the biggest retailer or brand, whatever it's called, yeah. in the world. And when I talk to 15 years old and I tell them, you know, just be sustainable, you don't need 20 t-shirts at one pound a t-shirt, you maybe need one. And they look at me like, are you crazy? So what's happening now? Yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a huge shift in mindset. That's the issue. I think what we've seen is that the financial crisis that we've just gone through has only just begun. And the reason why it happened is because 50-somethings have a short-term mindset. So it's going to take a very long time for, funnily enough, for this to actually happen because it requires education and inspiration to say that thinking in this way is actually really cool. And that's the kind of attitude that needs to change. And it's, it's the, the, the difference between this is, it's a bit like the kind of Al Gore speech where he says, boiling a frog and all that stuff. Mm. Actually, this is the same subject, but it's not about humanity. So it's not about the environment, it's about humanity. And I think that's the kind of interesting stepping stones that starts with parents. It says, if you're a parent with young children, start now, because that's the kind of thing. And interestingly, like my, my wife and I, uh, my wife's Norwegian, so she teaches me all this stuff. I'm British, so I'm like, yeah, Primark. So she's teaching no. me all this stuff. And um, my daughter and my son at Christmas, we're giving them only four presents now which is something they want, something they need, something to wear and something to read. And they won't know within a year's time there's anything different to four presents. But that kind of slower kind of attitude is quite interesting. And it was that, that those four rules came from a Japanese philosopher, which is that if you've got lots of stuff in your closet and your wardrobe, ask yourself, do you love it and do you really, really want it? If you don't, get rid of it or recycle it. So it's a, it's, a, it's a very, very big change that's coming. Well, I hope I'll be around to see no. the world <laughs> I hope actually so. change. Thank you so much. Thank you.